안녕하십니까? 네. Is anyone needing any translation this afternoon? Raise your hand. No? So I, maybe I should give a talk in. Oh, you need translation? All right. Um, how many of you were in my session yesterday? Raise your hand. Some of you. Okay, so there's a little bit of overlapping uh, slides, but uh, I added some new slides, so uh, I think there's something new that uh, you might find interesting. So I did not know anything about in s o n g g y o y u I had a complete uh, different idea about this session, and what I prepared for this session is about competencies in the future global leaders. So it's very different from what she has presented, but I think there's some common themes as well. What I have seen at, at Stanford University and what I believe it is required for young uh, people as they grow and study, and uh, that's what I wanted to talk about. So here we go. I wanted to talk about competencies in effective behavioral and cognitive dimensions. I think that uh, Dr. Lee already mentioned a little bit about that. Um, effective means what? Having empathy. You know, understanding someone's uh, issues and challenges, and perhaps having sympathy towards any pains or uh, difficulties that others might have. I think that is becoming more important competencies uh, for the future generations. And behavioral, obviously, you got to have an action. You could have some ideas, but if you don't have any action, you're not taking any action. Then whatever the great idea you might have has no value, right? And cognitive dimensions, if you are taking an, an action, you've got to plan it correctly. You've got to have strategies. You have to understand the subject, the context, and all those things to make the proper actions as well. So I, I believe these are important uh, competencies for future generations. Uh, Alvin Toffler, I think I shared this yesterday, the illiterate of the 21st century are not those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Basically, this statement is asking us, are we capable of rebooting our thinking? Can we reboot our thinking? You know, sometimes you may have to think differently about the same thing. Sometimes you have to lose the perspectives about the tradition or things that you've been doing for a very long time, but all of a sudden, because of the technological advancements or changes in the society, you may have to think differently. Do we have that capability? That is the question here. And Gandhi said, "Lifelong, I mean, li live as if you were to die tomorrow. Learn as if you were to live forever." And my statement regarding this is: that lifelong learning is the new privilege for all. Lifelong learning is not for a certain group of people. It is for everyone. All of us here, we have to continuously. Learn and relearn and unlearn. We have to continuously get in this cycle. It's not something that's designated for a certain period in our life. I'll give you a, a, this picture. What do you see in this picture? This is a child. This is a real bone of dead child with clothes on. That's how this young boy was killed in Rwanda, in Africa, in 1994. Do you guys know about genocide? Genocide in 1994, that's what happened in Rwanda in 1994. There were two tribes, Hutus and Tutsis, when Belgium was uh, in that country, uh, colonizing the country. Things were sort of a peaceful uh, because they sort of led the country and then gave the power to the Tutsis. But when Belgium left the country, Now the conflict all over started again. And during about 90 days from the early April uh, to uh, June, about 800,000 people were murdered. They were killed. And this was a big issue for the whole global community. And this was discussed even in the U.S. Congress, whether the U.S. should intervene or not. And they ended up not intervening in this conflict. And a lot of people were asking this question, why do we care about this incident, about this massacre that happened in Rwanda? 
the people who committed this crime were highly educated. That is the key word. These were not dumb people. They were highly educated people, had a very bad planning, obviously, uh, to kill one type of a tribal community. And we have to rethink, what's the purpose of education? What is the purpose of education? If educated people could commit such crime, do we need to educate people? And we have to rethink about the purpose of education. This painting is something that I took in Palestine. Do you see anything odd in this painting? This painting was done by first graders. First graders in elementary school. Do you see anything odd? You see the rocket falling on a house? That's what they do in art class. This is so sad that little children are painting and depicting the realities of their life. And it was very sad to see this. Now, what were other people doing when things were happening in Palestine? Right? This was not directly impacting our thinking. Maybe, maybe students in our classrooms might think that, oh, that's someone else's problem. It's not our problem. Right? But I think that we have to rethink. This is a global community now. What happens in other, the other side of the country matters to us. So I recommend these books to my students. And whenever who comes to me for advice, I give them these books. I tell them, you may want to read these books and understand what's happening around the world. If you do not understand the global affairs, you are just confined in your room, in your classroom, learning whatever you think it is important and not knowing how what's happening in the other side of the world might have an impact on what we are doing in our own country. And these are some of the, some of the books that I recommend. You have to understand what's happening in the other side of the world. So some of the books uh, that, that I recommend to students. And this particular student, Pia Sorka, one of the students who took my class at Stanford, she started this NGO called the Teach AIDS. Her passion was to help eradicate HIV AIDS. After taking a few courses, she wanted to find her own uh, NGO. And then uh, she is meeting with the Dalai Lama and discussing plans uh, to expand her program, etc. But there is some common theme here. You remember what I talked about dimensions, three dimensions, affective, cognitive, and behavioral? Think what kind of a characteristic that she had when she was thinking about starting her own NGO to help reduce the number of HIV AIDS patients around the world. I talked about this project in the class. Basically, I mentioned about a project of a Korean professor from Chungbuk National University. This professor here is a medical doctor who is also a cartoonist. He draws cartoons. But his passion was to help educate people with health issues. So that was his uh, a hobby. And I connected him with my student Pia Sorka, and that's what they came up with, working together collaborating together globally and come up with this global teach aids education program. Now, we can think about grand ideas, but if there is no action, nothing happens. But in this case, the student took an initiative to make this happen. This is one of my projects that I'm involved. You know, I think about big projects, but I like to get in the action. So what I do is I go around the world, collect stories from children in various places, from underserved communities. I collect children's stories, and I publish books based on their real stories about their challenges, the hardship, and the conditions they are living in. I collect their stories, and I publish books. I give them awards based on how great their stories are. Each story conveys a message of wisdom, a wisdom that can be shared in the global community. Their wisdom conveys uh, things like you know, courage, peace, harmony, and forgiving. That sort of messages, so that more children can share their stories and then learn about what's happening in the other side of the world. 
It's not just the theories in class. I get them involved in these projects. This particular girl wrote a story about child soldier in Uganda, about child soldier issue in Uganda, and then she won this competition by writing the story. The story is now shared through Amazon and as well as in many other places. But at the same time, when the stories are made, I involve other volunteers, volunteer, young volunteers who can paint and illustrate these stories so they can work together. So I send the photo of the child to the painter, and then she, when the painter paints, she looks at the face of the child and then come up with the paintings. This is a, a, a hard work for this project to, to make an uh, make a, a, a impact in other part of the world. This is a sample, a front page of the book. The book starts with a map where the story is from and then a photo of the child as well. So that these stories are shared with other children around the world and I partner with an NGO called World Reader. And World Reader is a, a big NGO. They distribute many of these stories to various parts of the world. And they are reaching 6 million children around the world. So we supply our stories to them so that they can distribute these stories. Probably you have read stories like Cinderella stories or Snow White, you know, that sort of stories. But I don't know what kind of value those stories may convey to the children. In my view, the real stories from real children may have much, much more valuable message for their peers in the other side of the world. And then obviously we have these stories on Amazon. And then when we raise funds through this, we pay for the fees for the education of the children who are involved in this project. Are you guys familiar with this? I think I shared this slide yesterday. This little girl who has heart for those uh, friends who were born without hands. Right? Um, she obviously had the 3D printer and a little bit of help from her father. She was able to print hands, artificial hands, for uh, many other friends who were born without hands. Now, this is not the type of education you would find in typical classroom, but she has the character. She has the skills, and she has the will, and then she acted upon this to help children around the world. Now, another characteristic that I think it is important is questioning. I think I shared this yesterday as well. But children uh, between age 2 to 5, they ask about 40,000 questions. But as they grow and they go to school, the number of questions they ask drops drastically. The more they go to school, they don't ask questions because our current education systems do not give our students a chance to ask questions. And I think that that is a big problem. And companies like Google, they have a culture of asking questions and evaluating each other's questions. They have a system called Dory. You guys have seen the movie Finding Nemo, right? There's a bluefish, Dory, which asks questions constantly, right? And they have the system. And what I'm impressed about Google as a company is not because they have this system, but because they have the culture of questioning, which is very difficult to replicate in our organizations, in companies, in schools. Blockbuster was one of the comp successful companies in the US, but they went down and they lost to Netflix. Netflix, probably you guys know, it's a much a bigger, larger company. Blockbuster is now closed. It, they went bankrupt. They went bankrupt because they did not ask the right questions. Initially, Netflix wanted to work with Blockbuster, but Blockbuster thought that, well, you guys are too small, and we don't think the internet is really an important uh, structure in the future, and they didn't pay attention, and they did not ask questions about their future fate, and then that's what happened. Netflix took over. Southwest Airlines is another company that asked a series of important questions. After 9-11 in the US, a lot of people were afraid to fly but they asked the questions, how do we get the people to fly again? How do we get them to feel comfortable flying? And then the company has become uh, much larger and very successful with the growth. Another thing, uh, you guys know you, uh, Airbnb, right? Someone asked the right question. 
should the hotels be the only way for accommodations? But this founder thought that maybe there is a different way. These companies get started and they experience growth because they ask questions. So I believe the great question is the new innovation. If there's no question, there's no learning, there's no change, there's no innovation. And that's what I believe. And that's what we need in classrooms. We need to get our children to ask questions. That's why I came up with this project called SMILE, Stanford Mobile Inquiry-Based Learning Environment. This whole learning model, this whole pedagogy, it's about questioning, getting the people to ask questions. And I wanted to have the same experience in places where there's no electricity, no internet, so I came up with this particular piece of technology, Smile Plug, so that I can take it to various places where there's no electricity, no internet, yet they have this valuable questioning curriculum. And then it comes with the Wikipedia, Khan Academy, and four different coding schools and various open source textbooks as well. And then we give these plug computers to universities in Africa because they do not have the electricity and reliable internet. And we are sharing the knowledge and learning models through technology. As an education technologist, that's what I do. I leverage technology to enhance education quality in places where they may not have resources. And I was able to reduce the cost of this particular device so that I could have this project in developing countries. In terms of the pedagogical model of SMILE, it's pretty simple. The teachers would give an overview of a topic and students start to make questions. They share their questions with their peers and they reflect upon them and then they learn. That's how they engage in this particular model. And I have taken this project to Tanzania uh, and uh, Rwanda, Uganda, Ethiopia, and South Africa, Ghana, uh, Liberia, and many different countries. But I work with a very uh, large partners to implement this project. But I think what I'm trying to do with this project is more than getting them to learn subjects. I want them to ask questions, important questions, so that they can learn not only what they're learning in their textbooks, but also what they should learn in their community and schools as well. If they do not ask questions, I don't think a society could thrive, and I don't think there could be justice in countries. This is an example of uh, questions from Ethiopia. In the early days of the SMILE project, students were asking a question like this. The one on the left is the question uh, from the early stage of SMILE project. When was Ethiopia invaded by fascist Italy? That was pretty much simple recall question. We learned this kind of questions in our history class. When was something happened? What, when was the event took place? That sort of things. But after six months of a smile sessions, because they are constantly asking each other questions and find ways to improve their questions, and then this is the question they came up with. Does our constitution protect women's rights? What I'm trying to do in a country like Ethiopia is not just to tell them what to study, but give them an ability and help them develop the ability to ask better questions so that they are not only developing their own uh, characters and capabilities, but also they are developing questioning skills that could lead to changing their society and improving the country as well. Grit is another matter that I am very concerned about, the power of a passion and perseverance. Jack Andraka is a Stanford student, currently at Stanford University. He's a, a sophomore. At 15, he invented a method to detect um, pancreatic cancer at, at age 15 at age 15 is the key word here this young entrepreneur wanted to come up with this model because one of his uh, cousins or his relatives died of a, a pancreatic cancer and he had empathy right so if you look back on the first slide about affective behavioral and cognitive dimensions you know, you can see how that is related to grit. Another student, Tara, she's a founder and CEO of Iridescent, a science education company that focuses on teaching young girls in uh, developing regions, uh, science. 
And when she started this company, there were a lot of challenges. She failed 59 times in a normal scenario when we try to present our ideas and get funding, etc. If 59 people say no, you probably give up. But she did not. At the 60th uh, trial, she was able to raise $150 million to make her dream come true. Now, she's very busy traveling around the world. This slide is about the MOOC class that I talked about. Uh, I had about 20,000 students from 170 different countries. And what's unique about this particular online class was that there were a lot of volunteers who saw the value of sharing knowledge and passion in the online space. So they were tweeting in various different languages and then they had a team projects, countries from pa like Pakistan and uh, Tanzania, South Africa, many different countries. They had team projects to better themselves and society and also improve their education systems. And I sent this message while I was traveling in Tanzania and welcoming all the students to this particular MOOC class and having them work on projects that matter to the society and the global community as well. I'm going a little fast because my time is running out, but they had their local meetups to share their passion, their knowledge, and then uh, they were able to post their photos to motivate other peers as well in this class. And some of the students uh, downloaded all the videos from my MOOC and added the subtitles so that they can share with more students in China. China. And also in Saudi Arabia, they were able to do the same thing. They were able to add the subtitles for this course and then share. I did not ask them to do that. They did it on a voluntary basis as well. Amazing that what volunteerism can achieve because they saw value. This particular student, Ellen Dong, is a very interesting student. After taking the class that I off offered, she decided to work for children in the underserved regions. And there are many, many ch students who have taken the course and became an NGO leader, an NGO starter as well, and volunteers around the world. This is my favorite slide. I think we as an educators, this is what we may be. We may be broken mirrors. Broken mirrors, not a perfect circular mirror or square mirrors not in a perfect shape, we may be broken mirrors, but at least we can do one thing, is that we can reflect light to create beautiful things together. And we tend to have, a, we have a tendency to go with the flow. We hear that a lot. Don't stand out, go with the flow, right? But you know what will happen when you go with the flow. The other way is to go against the flow, do something different not just for yourself, but for the global community as a global citizen. And then you can let many more new life forms to start. I shared this yesterday as, as well. Dick Fosbury, this is a person who jumped backward in Olympic Games. Before him, everybody was jumping forward. But this man made a history in Olympic Games. He's the first one who back, uh, jumped backward and that was an innovative thinking and I believe that was re sort of a rebooting your idea. Another girl that I, uh, that I, I a story that I share a lot, Gabby Shul. She had a cancer. She had a cancer uh, so she had to cut off her leg and she saved her foot and attached to her limb. But she had a dream to be a dancer. She wanted to be a dancer, but she had these two challenges, major challenges, amputation and cancer. How many of us can survive cancer or amputation? But she never gave up her dream. She became a dancer. And she says that never give up on your dreams. The point that I'm trying to make is this. I think we have to, not only educating our children to be you know, we talk about smart, intelligence, and all those things, but we want them to have heart for others. And when they have a heart for others, we want them to take action, not just thinking about it in your head, but go out there and make a difference. 
And that's the kind of character that I would like to see in the future generation leaders. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Kim, may Hulyungan, the Kangyan, a Tashabu Paksu, Chushi Baramuda.